What's up guys and welcome to the ending explained for Ouija Origin of Evil. Now this is technically a sequel to the very bad movie Ouija from 2014, but this is a surprisingly vastly superior prequel set in the 1960s. Origin of Evil does have its own independent story from the first one and an ending that needs explanation, but there's also plenty of connections to the first film as well. So I'll be diving into a bunch of stuff today, but don't worry, I've had plenty of man juice to power through. According to the first movie, that's what people call coffee. This guy is like, yeah. I'll take a refill of man juice, just like everyone does. A little more bean juice? A little more bean juice. Mmm, man juice. First, let's look at the most important connective tissue between the two movies. Both are focused around the same house as the source of the supernatural turmoil, though again the stories are separated by decades. And in the original film, it's the same characters, at least the sisters, Doris and Lena from the prequel, that are essentially the villains in the 2014 film due to the events of this movie. In the original, we are led to believe an elderly Lena, again the same character much younger in Origin of Evil, is helping Lane and fills us in on the Xander backstory. But it turns out that Lena is lying and essentially tricks Lane into freeing her sister Doris to cause even more mayhem. But all that takes place several decades after Origin of Evil, so let's backtrack and get to know the Xanders before everything spiraled out of control. In the beginning, the Xanders were a somewhat normal family living in the era of love. Things haven't been easy lately for Doris, Sister Lena, and her mother Alice since their dad Roger passed away. They are scraping by as charlatan fortune tellers, making a living by giving phony seances to people. Their intentions are mostly good though, hoping to give their clients closure with their deceased relatives, rather than simply tricking them out of money. But they still aren't making enough to live off of, and based on Lena's suggestion, Mom picks up a Ouija board in an attempt to spice up their act. And it's of course bringing the board into their home that things start to get bad for the Xanders. While Alice tests out the board which she has magnetized, she unwittingly connects with a spirit called Marcus that speaks briefly through Doris. Later in All Alone, Doris uses the board and contacts a spirit that spells out, Hi friend. This specifically is also seen several times in the original film, way more in that one actually. But unbeknownst to Doris, by using the board by herself, she has broken one of the board's three rules. Never use the board alone. The other two are never use the board in a graveyard and always say goodbye. She actually breaks all three, as we find out later there are bodies buried in the house and no one in the movie ever says goodbye. Ever. So from this point, Doris is communicating with the spirit Marcus, but she believes it is her father. Based on this, Doris convinces her mom and Lena to join her in a week session to contact Roger. And during the session, the board spells out an answer to a question that only Alice would know. And Alice also starts to believe it could be her dead husband communicating with them. This isn't accurate, but we do now know that Doris does in fact have real psychic abilities, whereas her mom was only ever faking. Later, Doris uses the board alone once more, and this time actually sees the spirit of Marcus through the planchette. Love getting to use that word. Planchette. And Marcus appears in the mirror. We see that Marcus is an all black sort of smolder looking humanoid creature with waves of smoke around it and glowing red eyes. It bends Doris back into a most unnatural position and jams his arm into her. Due to this, Doris is now entirely possessed by the spirit rather than just communicating with it. And the change in Doris is quite clear as she becomes more malicious and starts being seen with white eyes and a really big mouth and stuff. It's weird looking. Lena is understandably still unsure about what exactly is going on with her sister, and after seeing her writing a bunch of pages in a foreign language, brings them to Father Tom, who works at the girls' school. Once translated, Father Tom visits the Xander house, but doesn't let on what he knows quite yet, and asks Doris to lead a Ouija session under the guise of contacting his dead wife. Everyone's spouses are dead, apparently. When asked who they are communicating with, a name is spelled out, but Tom later reveals that name was not actually his dead wife's name, but rather it was a name Father Tom chose to consciously focus on in his mind when awaiting an answer from the board. And the name he was thinking rather than what is true is what the board spelled out. So this tells us what happened in the earlier scene where it appeared to be Roger they were contacting. The spirit is able to see what we are thinking when using the board and most people would concentrate on what they know the answer to be to a question. So if he thought the name Samantha, that's what the board would see, whether it's accurate or not. Father Tom then gives us an exposition dump explaining all about the pages, which it turns out are written in Polish. And the origin of a horrific event that happened in the house years ago. It turns out that around World War II, a deranged German doctor performed torturous experiments on a number of Jewish slash Polish people in a room hidden in the basement of the house. The doctor then buried them in a hidden area in the walls, and due to their violent deaths, their spirits were most likely left in a state of unrest. Later, Father Tom discovers the bodies, and then they realize they've been using the Ouija board over a graveyard this entire time, breaking one of the rules, as I mentioned. Also, I'm not 100% sure that the charred monster Marcus is supposed to be that same evil doctor after his death becoming a malevolent spirit or something, 
but they are both played by Doug Jones, so I do believe this is their intent with the character. Even though we don't actually see the Doctor as a person in the movie, that ended up cut out of the theatrical version for some reason. So now we know the spirit needs a vessel such as Doris because it does not have a voice, and it wants one. It probably can only communicate via the board, and then we need someone to violate all three of the rules to be able to possess them, taking their voice. It also needs a vessel with significant psychic powers, as we know Doris does, as well as Lena. However, her mother does not, and we're told that this ability skips a generation. And as far as the whispering into people's ears, we don't know exactly what Doris is telling them, but we find out in the first one, as described by elderly Lena, that it is both the most wonderful and horrible things all at once. It's more about the demon using its voice to influence and bend others to its will, which, you know, usually means killing them. This specific concept is seen much more prevalently in the first movie, where most of the time once someone is possessed, they kill themselves in a pretty stupid fashion. And it seems like in this one, it's Doris, or rather Marcus, specifically doing the killing, as she hangs Lena's boyfriend Mikey, and later causes Father Tom to abruptly break his neck, getting knocked back by a super blast from Doris's mouth. All right, so going into the finale, we know that Doris already has whispered to Lena, and that Lena has psychic capabilities like Doris, and she even gets help from a vision of her father, who shows her how to stop Doris by sewing her lips shut, which would effectively stop the voice. Our final showdown is in the doctor's secret torture room, with Alice shackled to the experimental table, and it's up to Lena to finally stop Doris. She is able to easily overpower her, and begins to sew her lips shut, but she finds herself having some difficulty, thanks to all the weird black spirits suddenly all around her, which are the other spirits of people the evil doctor has killed and buried in the house. Lena is able to finish sewing Doris's lips closed, and Doris lies on the ground motionless, apparently dead. Lena goes to free her mother, but in a quite shocking turn of events, she stabs her. And we see Lena's eyes are white, just like her sister's have been, and it appears the voice has been transferred to her, or at least Marcus took over. The way this scene is constructed, it's a little difficult to see exactly what happens, but based on Doris whispering to Lena earlier, Lena also having psychic abilities, and the spirits we see all around her, there's plenty of opportunities for Marcus to take control of Lena before Doris's lips are sewn. It also seems to quickly be able to take over Father Tom earlier, when he became white-eyed and was attacking the girls. So this kind of sets the precedent for it to happen to Lena as well. From here, we transition to Lena in a mental institution where it seems that the public perception is that Lena went crazy. However, they never were able to find Doris's body. Lena heads back to her patient room and constructs a Ouija board from her own blood, summoning her sister. A doctor even sees Doris in the room with Lena before Doris appears on the ceiling behind him, white-eyed and crazy looking. So we know that even though Lena appeared normal, she is still under the influence of the evil spirit and now Doris specifically. It seems that the child Doris's spirit is doomed to be an evil spirit left to the void wanting to claim more victims. Essentially, the child is gone forever. And that's the end of the movie for the most part, but there is a short scene after the credits that ties directly into the first movie. We see Lena sitting in a wheelchair, and then she transitions to elderly Lena as played by Lin Shay in the first movie. We hear that her niece is here to see you, which would set it directly before the first time we see elderly Lena in the first film. Lane, the lead character from that film goes to talk to Lena, posing as her niece, and gets information about the history of the Xanders, as well as unknowingly manipulated by Lena, who even after all these years is still under the spirit's control. She tells Lane that it's her mother that's the evil one, and is the one who has to be destroyed. But that's not true, of course. And we also know, thanks to the first movie, that Doris's body is still in the house, and has been ever since the events at the end of Origin of Evil. I'm sure that Lena hid her body in the attic, a location which we never see in the movie, and Doris's body plays a significant part in in the plot of Ouija, with Lena duping Lane into cutting open Doris's lips, removing the stitches. And as I mentioned, Doris is actually the villain of part one, now the evil spirit torturing a bunch of teenagers in modern times. In that movie, we are led to believe that Mother Alice is the evil one, and Stitch Up Doris is the one that needs help, but once her lips are opened, destroys the spirit of Alice, and the kids realize it's actually Doris that's the evil one. I thought about not spoiling the ending, but at this point, who cares? That movie isn't great anyway. So at the end of the first one, the kids burn Doris's body in a furnace, and I guess banish her spirit for good. But Lena is still out there, so who knows if things will ever truly be over. Well, there you go, folks. Origin of Evil's ending explained, as well as all the ways that movie tied into the previous one. But what did you guys think about the ending? And do you have any other movie endings you want me to explain? Well, let me know down in the comments below. Thanks for watching Found Flicks, guys. We'll see you next time.